Welcome. In this lecture, we're going to look at the meaning of conceptual imagery. This is your first real opportunity in this class to sink your teeth into the idea of using real images. I've encouraged you to work pretty abstractly up until now, and some of you have and some of you haven't, but the, um, the assignments so far have all been um, They've all been things that you could create completely abstractly. In this assignment, you're required to look for images, photographs of real things, and put them together in a creative way to create your own new composition. So let's talk a little bit about how you might choose those images. Images mean things, right? So we're going to look at conceptual techniques and talk about what the meaning of meaning is in a work of art. There are a couple of different ways that things can mean something. The denotation, we could say, is the literal meaning of an image of words. For example, we know what the sun is. The sun is a big ball of gas that imparts heat and light to our world. We know what a cloud is. It's a big wad of water vapor that floats around up there and rains on, on us occasionally. However, the way that you depict a sun or a cloud in your visual imagery may give the image a different connotation. A sun might equal a ray of hope. A cloud might equal a sense of woe. Connotation, that emotive or evocative meaning that a work of art can convey is the thing that we're really going to talk about in this lecture. We're going to talk about how symbolism, ambiguity, metaphor, establishing an emotional tone and borrowing from art history are all ways that you can evoke meanings from the images that you choose. Symbolism first. Symbolism means that we are using a visual image very much in the way that we use words to impart meaning, to communicate very directly. For example, here are a bunch of symbols that were created for a, uh, an Olympics uh, event some years ago. They were created to communicate very important information to a bunch of different people who would be all different ages, from countries all over the world, not necessarily with a common language, um, but all needing to know where the restrooms are, where the hospital is, where to catch a bus, that sort of thing. You'll notice, though, that these symbols do more than impart information. These symbols have a great deal of design unity. They were probably created by a team rather than one individual, but you can look at these symbols and analyze them and probably kind of figure out what the rules were that these designers may have agreed to use together, right? How big negative shapes would be allowed to be, what angles would be allowed to be employed, what kinds of curves besides the perfect circle could be used, that sort of thing, so that the symbols communicate a feeling of a time, for example. It's pretty clear that these symbols were not invented 100 years ago, maybe 30 years ago, right? Um, a personality, even though it may not be the personality of one designer, it is, um, it's that unity that gives the impression that these have a human soul behind them, even though it may have been many human souls. What I'm trying to say is that no matter how simple your forms are or your images are, there's something about those visuals that's going to convey more than just the information. This is where you anchor your boat. This is where you find a phone. The problem with symbols, of course, is that they can be very predictable. They can be overused. And when they're overused, that betrays a lack of original thought, which we find to be very cliched. Easy to think of examples of that. When this uh, symbol for a loving New York City was designed by Milton Glaser, I remember 
that it was considered to be a very, very snappy, um, concise, heartfelt solution to the design problem, even though, obviously, the heart was a very well-known symbol. It had never been used in that way before, but it didn't take very long before that symbol became a cliché. We've all seen so many posters and signs and bumper stickers and billboards that say, I heart this and I heart that, that we roll our eyes pretty much when we see a big red heart or even a green one. Maybe it's still possible to make a twist on this that seems creative, a little bit less cliched, but it gets harder, right? As cliches become popular, they lose their power. It's easy to think of ways of drawing things, ways of seeing things, ways of representing things that are overdone. And the hard part, of course, is to come up with ways of seeing and presenting things that are original. Symbolism can be extremely personal. It doesn't have to be so um, widely recognizable that everyone who comes to the Olympic Games can understand exactly what it means. For example, in this self-portrait by Frida Kahlo, we see some images that are obviously symbolizing something, but it's much more obscure, much more open to question what those symbols mean. When I've showed this painting to many of my students, they seem to think that the gentleman painted on Frida Kahlo's forehead may be much in her thoughts. They notice that he has a third eye, but that he is painted in the place of her third eye. Many people speculate on what that might mean, and I'm not going to try to tell you. I will tell you that the uh, fellow on her forehead is her sometime husband, Diego Rivera, a painter himself who was quite famous and renowned during their lifetimes, more famous probably than she was at that point, although her fame has probably superseded his since then. Here's another double self-portrait by Frida Kahlo. You see Frida herself in the photograph on the right, so you can judge how good the likeness is that she uh, painted. It seems to me that she felt free to paint herself maybe more sternly in some way, maybe without uh, some of the physical beauty that she really had for reasons of her own. I'll let you think about what the visual symbols might be here. The heart laid open on one side and laid bare on the other side. The fact that she's painted herself twice, once in a white dress and once in more everyday colors. The fact that a vein seems to be connecting the two Fridas, and the vein seems to be bleeding onto the white dress. Clearly, um, painted at the time of her divorce, it must be some kind of expression of her feelings at that time. But these are personal symbols that leave us with as many questions, perhaps, as they do answers. Here's another painting by Van Eck. We looked at some of his paintings in assignment two. This painting is generally felt to be full of symbols. When I was in art school, I was told that the shoes on the floor, the puppy, the oranges in the curtain, uh, or in the window in the back here, were all symbols of fertility, and that the young woman on the right is obviously pregnant or possibly depicted as if she were pregnant in the hope that she would become pregnant. Um, this was considered to be a wedding portrait, and it's titled that here in quotes because I recently heard or I recently read a piece by an art, art historian about this painting claiming that it's not a wedding portrait at all. It was a contract that the gentleman on the right was a wealthy fabric merchant who was leaving the country and leaving his business in the hands of this relation, possibly his wife, possibly some other relation, the f many folds of fabric that make her look pregnant to our 21st century eyes were intended, according to this art historian, to make her look wealthy and to make the business look prosperous. And that the raised hand of the gentleman and the joined hands of the couple were a symbol that she was being given authority 
to make payments, to take payments, to write contracts, and so forth while he was away. Who knows? Symbols can certainly change their meaning, and when their meaning isn't cut and dried, we are often left to speculate. This leads us very nicely to ambiguity. Ambiguity in terms of positive and negative space is what we aimed for in assignment three, but of course ambiguity can have a much broader meaning. When I asked my students what they see in this painting here by Salvador Dali, many of them say that they see a woman's face. Many of them say that they see planets or billiard balls or some kind of spheres dashing around. But almost everyone agrees, finally, that they see a woman's face as well. Two very, very disparate things to see, right? Why on earth would a painter choose to paint a woman's face made of planets or billiard balls or spheres or whatever they are? The theories that I've heard from some of my students are things like she may have had cosmic meaning for Dali. She may have been a goddess-like figure inhabiting the whole universe. She may have been a girlfriend that meant the world to him or meant the universe to him. It's very, very difficult to know, of course, and that's part of the charm and the mystery of a painting like this. We can clearly see that there's a reason why Dali painted her in this unusual way. It seems to mean something very different from a more ordinary kind of a portrait, but trying to put that meaning into words, of course, is difficult. Metaphor is a word you may be familiar with if you've studied poetry. Metaphor is the word we use for meanings that are implied as opposed to literal meaning. And let's look at another Dali painting for this, The Three Sphinxes of Bikini. Now what an odd name and what odd imagery. When I ask my students what they see here, what's going on, most people agree that there are meant to be three heads some people will only admit to two, but most people think that the trees, because of their similarity in shape to the necks and white hairdos here of the other two heads are also, the trees are also a head. Most people think that those heads are not capped with real hair, but that it's something else. It's clouds. It's a mushroom cloud, it's steam, or smoke, or even shampoo, I've heard. I think the title of this painting is a clue to the meaning that it had for Dali. Bikinis, of course, to most of us uh, these days, I mean a bathing suit. <laughs> but to people in 1947, the bikini atoll had a lot of resonance as the first place where an atomic bomb was tested. I'll leave you to put those images and ideas together and see if you come up with any meaning of your own. Metaphor can happen in visual imagery, often by putting images together that would be innocuous on their own, but have a sort of um, strength or um, force when they're used together, as in this poster. In this painting by Picasso, Guernica, there's nothing very metaphorical. The images are fairly literal, and it's more the way that they're painted or depicted that establishes an emotional tone. We're going to look at other emotional tones that you could establish besides this one of agony and horror at the uh, depredations of war. But this painting of the assault on the town of Guernica during the Spanish Civil War remains, for me, one of the most powerful examples of establishing an emotional tone. But let's lighten up a bit and look at some other emotional tones. 
humor, for example. In the work of Dwayne Hansen, we see um, very, very ordinary figures depicted, recreated as three-dimensional sculptures in absolutely perfect detail, down to the pores on their skin. He used a casting technique, which is um, almost incredible in its detail. And of course, it's this very lifelikeness that gives these figures their hilarity. I actually walked up to a Dwayne Hansen museum guard in the Philadelphia Art Museum many years ago and asked it for the time to the great amusement of my uh, <laughs> fellow museum goers who had probably done the same thing right before I walked into the room. The element of surprise, of course, can make us laugh or at least get a rise out of us in some way. R. Mutt, who you see signed this urinal, um, or it was a urinal, it's been turned upside down, of course, was really the artist Marcel Duchamp, who made a career out of surprising his viewers. Finally, borrowing from or referring to art history can be another very playful way of getting the element of surprise and often humor into a work of art. I'm sure you've all seen things like this done before. And I suppose, why not? I'm sure Rembrandt and da Vinci can take it. Here are a couple more examples of the same sort of thing. A very famous image by Hokusai, Japanese printmaker. Some ads for Japanese beer, which obviously take off on that image and capitalize on it in a funny way. So I hope this gives you some things to think about as you choose your imagery for assignment 4.1. Your collage can not only look beautiful, but it can mean something. And if you wish it to be, uh, to have a particular theme, to set an emotional tone, to tell a story, to symbolize ideas, you'll want to keep that in mind as you choose your images. Have fun, and I'm looking forward to seeing what you come up with. Goodbye for now, and we'll see you back for the next lecture.